we need to own what we do. Uh, we've been apologizing and apologetic for being in HR instead of owning what we do. Every other profession says, I'm a salesperson. I'm a finance person. I'm a marketer. We go, I'm sorry I'm in HR. Don't conduct your analysis in isolation because data is so incredibly powerful. Not defending just the tribe, but defending the organization. Those creative people that you really want to keep empowered, keep excited, keep motivated, keep thinking. A good experience pays dividends down the line. Stereotypes tend to break down in proximity. Welcome to We're Only Human, a podcast about human resources, business, technology, and the workplace. My name is Ben Eubanks, your host, and I'm so glad you're here. Hey everyone, it's Ben Eubanks. Earlier this summer, I had a chance to run an event called HR Summer School. It was tremendous. It was spectacular. It was all those uh, superlatives that I could throw in there. It was just an amazing experience. And one of the things that was amazing for me is secretly, actually probably not so secretly, I've mentioned this a couple times during the event, secretly though, I'm over there taking notes, learning myself as people are speaking, as people are sharing, talking about all these amazing ways that we can get better at HR and talent and learning and the things that we have to do day to day to help the business run. And one of the speakers that shared at the event, Steve Brown, um, his session was probably the best attended out of all the contents at the conference. And I decided to share that here. So we're going to replay the conversation that I had with Steve Brown. If you don't know Steve, you're missing out. He he seems to know everyone. I jokingly call him in the conversation the most connected man in HR, most connected person in HR, and you'll see why. He he knows people's names. He remembers people, and he's going to talk about the importance of that, how to humanize the work we do, how to, how to know people, how to remember people, and how to be remembered as an HR leader, what kind of a, a legacy we're leaving behind, so on. Actually, there's a session on your HR legacy. We'll talk – I might replay that one as well on the podcast in the coming weeks and months just because – we had so many good conversations there. If you enjoyed this conversation with Steve and you're like, wow, this is phenomenal, we actually have the entire replay available. If you did not catch the sessions, you did not catch the conference, you want to check this out, you hear this and you're like, wow, that's good, just know that Steve is one of 50 speakers we had at the event. And you can get that at humanresourcesacademy.org. You can get that at humanresourcesacademy.org. That's where all of our courses and other good stuff are if you want to check those out. So without further ado, I'm going to get out of the way so we can hear from Steve Brown. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to HR Summer School Fireside Chats. So when I went out there and I asked the everybody that's kind of tuned in, watching what's happening, I have a kind of a group of people that are supporting the event. And I said, hey, who do you want to see take the virtual stage, talk, talk about what's, what's on their heart? And one of the resounding answers was Steve Brown. They want to hear from the most connected man in HR, as I like to call him. So I have him here with us. Steve, welcome to the conversation. Hi, Ben. This is so cool. I'm so glad you're doing this program. I think it's needed, and I'm glad you, you're putting it on. Absolutely. Well, it's, it's about education. It's about inspiration, but it's also about connection. And that's where I really want to hear from you a little bit because I wasn't kidding a minute ago. Like you, everyone I know knows you. And when I'm like, Hey, you know, about, I meet random people in when I was in England earlier this year and they're like, Oh, Steve Brown. Yeah, absolutely. So like, that's both amazing and like crazy that you've done that. So talk a little about what you do first gives the audience some background into, into who Steve is and then I'll I'll mm -hmm. dive into kind of that question thread and try to tease out how we can all do that a little better sure uh, professionally I'm in HR been HR my entire career uh, now I'm an executive which is kind of fun to think about uh, I'm not your typical executive when you think of HR uh, and I tend to do HR much differently than most uh, much more people centric always have been uh, after my first job, to be honest, my first job didn't know that you could be people centric. Then I, then I learned, doggone it, you need to do this. Uh, but I've been in environments where I've allowed, been allowed to do that. And since I've been so people oriented, naturally, as a person, it just made sense to connect outside of my organization. And so I've been doing it for decades. I'm not surprised to hear that. And I actually had that same first job in HR where they're like, the people are a necessary evil to, for us doing your job. I'm like, wait a minute, we're supposed to be serving the people. This is right. what, what our job is all about. And so <laughs> it took the second job for I realized like, okay, maybe I'm not the crazy one here. Maybe that is actually an opportunity. You know, that, that's how things should work. So 
you talked about why you did that a little bit, right? That's just your natural bent, maybe your natural mm -hmm. inclination is mm -hmm. to, to reach out there and connect with people. Um, I don't know if you can, if it's easy to answer this question or not, but what is it like? Like, like what is, how do you do that intentionally? I guess I'll ask that more practical question. How do you do that intentionally? I learned from my mom. When I grew up in a small town, very small town, 2,500 people. And it was Mayberry, basically. And when you saw everybody, you'd walk up and down the street and everyone would talk to you by name. They wouldn't just say hello. They would say, hello, Ben. And they would do it. Every person, you walk into the drugstore and they go, oh, it's Mr. Smith. Hey, Steve. And it was just naturally our environment. So I, it was modeled for me. And then when I went to, uh, I was in a small school where it was K through 12 in one building. Uh, and, and this was in the 1980s. So it's not like, you know, pioneer days. Stone this age. Actually, no, this was, this, this was modern this, day. This, modern day still is K through 12 in one building. Uh, and I would know the teachers from kindergarten all the way through the superintendent. And I would know every student in every grade by name. And I'd walk down the hall and greet them by name. So it didn't seem abnormal for me. Then I went to college and in college, I just started doing it again. And uh, my fellow classmates used to get upset. I'd walk to class and I would say hi to every single person on the way to class and every person on the way back. And they go, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? People don't want to do this. And this is what I found. People want to be recognized. People want to be acknowledged. More than just a casual greeting. Casual greetings are great. Casual greetings are polite. You should do those things. But honestly, most casual greetings, we don't care. We don't really care how you're doing. We just say hello to say. Surface level. Skimming. Yeah. Hi, hi, Ben. How are you doing? Good, good. And then we move off. When you say somebody's name, they stop. It puts them in their tracks. So I've always felt that that added value to relationships, even if they were very uh, circumstantial, you know. Yeah. Then if a person chose to take a relationship deeper, you had a much better in than just being somebody who's a passerby. Hmm. As an HR person, you can do HR and do it passerby style, and people will despise you. <laughs> uh, but you can do it intentionally and connecting people is far more than knowing names, but knowing names is the key to start. Do you, I've always, I remember the Dale Carnegie quote. I don't know if you've ever, if you've read the book, how to win friends and influence people, I would be surprised if you had, but it's like the, the sweetest sound in any language is that person's own name. Right. So taking that kind of approach that you've taken there. I don't, I have, always struggled to remember names and I try to be intentional about it and I'll go in a room and someone's like, okay, that's Mary and that's Jim and over there by the coffee pot is, is Joe. And I'm like, okay, like I'm trying to like solidify all this. Any tips from you? Because you seem to be really good at it. Even if you fumble once in a while, none of us see that. We just see the Steve that knows everyone. So any tips or ideas like on how to do that better? Yes. I think there's two things. First, it has to matter. When I, when I see you, it has to matter that I know you by name. Uh, for instance, I know you, I know your wife, and I know your kids, but I know you. Now, I ask you your wife, I don't know her name. I, I don't get to see her regularly. And, and we get so caught up of, oh, if I forget Ben's wife's name, he's going to hate me forever. You don't know why my wife's name. We put all of this junk in our head that gets in the way because we're embarrassed, and it's not embarrassing at all. You have to get past that. And then it has to matter to know somebody's name. And I'll give you one quick example before I give you the tip. When you and I met in person for the first time at the uh, HR Evolution in Atlanta, I knew everybody's name before I walked in there. And so when I met Dan Crosby, I go, hey, Daniel, how are you? He's like, how do you know my name? <laughs> well, I've seen, I've seen your face. I've read your name. I can put two in together. Hi, Ben. Nice to meet you. Like, how do you know me? We're, we're fascinated that someone knows our names. Uh, the trick I learned a long time ago was say a person's name three times the first time you meet them and say something about them or learn something about them. So you say, uh, we can do it here. Uh, hi, Steve. So that's me. Huh. <laughs> uh, uh, hi, Ben. Hi, Ben. I'm Steve. Uh, ben, tell me what you do. I'm a writer. So Ben, you're a writer. What kind of things do you write, Ben? I write about how to make work more human. So Ben, when you write about things that make work more human, I also noticed that you wrote about uh, AI. How does that make work more human, Ben? 
we can keep going on this, but I get the thread here. I, I got, I get your kind of, right. It's so my thing is you, you, every time you ask about somebody, you tie their name to it. It sounds weird to say it. You're like, it Hey, I, well, it, when you're doing it, it doesn't sound weird, but when you're like, I want you to say someone's name three times in the next 30 seconds, we're like, that's gotta be awkward. Like I'm gonna try to like force that in the situation. But if you have just a little dialogue like that, and again, you're, I guess on your end, you're kind of cementing, this is who that person is. So next time I'm thinking about, Hey, that person that writes about making work more human, that's, that's what I've been. Right. And it's right. easy to tie that back. Right. And it, I want to have a better chance to remember your name. It's not foolproof. Okay. Uh, the other thing that's hard with remembering names is capacity. Uh, if you're a person who has a tight circle of friends, chances are you're good with 10 to 20 names and you'll know them and you'll know everything about their lives. Some people are wired differently and they can, you have a much larger capacity. I know thousands of people by me. Uh, we had talked right before we got on the call about how you went to London and there was a tweet up in London and it was put on by Kate Griffiths Lambeth, which is the coolest English name ever. And when I walked in, I said, hi, David. Hi, Simon. Hi, uh, Sarah. And they're like, how do you know? I'm like, I've been, I've known you for a long time. Now we get to meet in person. And uh, it just made everything much more personalized. I think connections need to be personal, but in order to do that, you need to be more vulnerable first and put it out there instead of being more guarded. So let's say someone's listening to this and they're like, yes, I believe this. I understand. I like, I grasp it mentally. What are the actual, um, I mean, they grasp it emotionally. Let's give them some rational ideas. Like what are some benefits of this? If you are getting better at this, whether it's broadly or even as an HR leader, you said it, kind of yourself, you, you hinted at this, that you can know your people better, even if you have a large workforce, like what are some, some benefits of this kind of approach? I think one of the biggest benefits is something I've seen that HR should be doing is we are the connector inside our organization, not people by names, but our job is to pull people together. So I pull uh, Gary from finance and have him work with Megan from marketing and Gary and Megan are great performers on their own but I need to get Gary and Megan to work together. So I'm that conduit. Being a connection is a conduit. I mean, if you look at the word connect, it's pulling things together. It's not just a big name game. So being a conduit in your organization, number one thing. Secondly, it personalizes the workplace. And if you can't personalize the workplace, you can't do HR in a people-centric environment. It, you're going to lead with things instead of people. You need to lead with people. There was a story I heard recently. I know you love, you love stories, so I want to share it with you really quick. There was a there's a town in Illinois called Rockford, and they were trying to end homelessness for veterans. And they've been fighting it for like ten years, and they made a change, and then within the next twelve months, had eliminated veteran homelessness completely. And the one big change they made was they stopped saying, "Okay, we have X number of homeless people in our area," but they started saying, "Okay, who's seen Gary lately? Is he still staying in this place?" You know, what can we do for Gary? Okay, what about Maria? Okay, I saw her the other day. Someone saw Maria. What about her? And they started humanizing it, and they solved this huge problem of veteran homelessness in this in the second largest city in the, the state of Illinois, right? Okay. So if humanizing can work on that scale, it can work at your scale in your company. So I love I love that idea, Steve. Yeah, and what I found, Ben, is that when you do that, people are much more open to having conversations, and you learn what's really going on with them both positive and negative. We keep, we keep trying to confine everything instead of allowing it to just be itself and people, people be themselves. I don't expect anybody to be like me, not one person. I want to come learn you for you. And if you have things that are very different than I am, you should, because you're a person. All of the things that we keep trying to program, diversity, inclusion, uh, recognition, performance management, all these things, would be so much simpler if we had a people lens first. And you personalize it first, and I'm telling you, they just flow. I love that. Goodness, that's, I'm over here, I'm with, I wish I was making notes as you're talking here, because I'm getting some good ideas on this. And this, again, this is kind of the way that I was, I learned early on, like I said earlier, I made the joke about it, but I learned early on that the people focus version of, of HR, it shouldn't be, um, it shouldn't be this mutual exclusive category where like, okay, I'm a business person and I'll, I'll force all these HR policies on you. Like you're saying, like, this is just a process approach because at the end of the day, 
the workforce is human and treating them as such will allow you to support them, serve them in a better way and lead them in a better way instead of treating them like widgets or employee number, you know, 731, I need you to come to the office. Like that's, <laughs> we laugh about that because we know it's true in some companies. Oh, it's some company out true. There, right now, as we're talking about this, some company out there is saying, Hey, someone call in employee 731, right? Because there are people that, that don't, don't do this. And that's why I specifically wanted to have you here for summer school to encourage this. It's, it's inspiring to hear how you do this and to hear that encouragement. And I'm personally thinking like next time I meet someone, how am I going to do this three times? How am I going to use their name so that I can talk to them and get this and remember this because that is going to make that connection that much deeper and more meaningful with that person. When the pandemic first hit, the first thing I saw was policy driven by our peers on social media. And one of my favorite ones was, uh, we are, we're letting people work from home and we haven't given them a technology policy of using their tech for work purposes and all this stuff, you know, and we didn't have them sign out their laptop and da da da. And so I wrote them back and it's not my company. And I said, do you have a problem stealing of people stealing laptops? And they said, no. I said, then why do you have a policy about it? And they went, uh, well, we're supposed to, because that's what we do. I said, why don't you say, Hey Ben, this is our uh, equipment. I need you to do your job through it. Can you do your job? Are you equipped to do your job? Because if you're equipped, man, I can't wait to work with you. And I know it's a whole new work environment and I trust you. And they went, does that work? I go, uh, yes. <laughs> uh, but there, I think we've been too, uh, I don't know what the right word, pressed into a mold that we think this is the only way to operate. Uh, one of the things I'm working on uh, it sounds so awful for my new book uh, is, is, is a new, is a new theory. And I call it the theory of HR. And what it is, is this, most companies start with results and then develop processes. We look at year over year results or month over month or quarter over quarter. We go, okay, we're up, we're down, we're in between. Therefore we develop new processes and then we stop. When you ask people who manage people, what's the number one thing they do all day? Is talk about people. They do. They, even if they're talking about a work process, it's like, well, you know, Steve's not doing this, this, and this. And they don't say the work's not getting done. They put a name to it. So, uh, and I write about this, but I changed it to say people plus processes equals results. So if I start with the people first, I give them the processes to do their jobs well, I'm going to get the results I'm really desiring. And if companies would do that, it would change who we are. But in order to do that, you need to be a connector. Uh, you can't do it just out of theory. You have to be someone who is well known by your people that you are the connection they can rely on. That is, that is excellent. I love that. Plus, one of the last questions I want to ask you about is I know for those of you that are, that are listening right now, you want to check it out. Steve has already written a book that was wildly popular, super bestseller, Oliver Sherm, called HR on Purpose, correct? Mm -hmm. And what's the, what's the, uh, kind of the, the, I almost said the plot. It's not a fiction book. And what is the summary of <laughs> HR, <laughs> HR on purpose? Uh, the big plot is that we, we need to own what we do. Uh, we've been apologizing and apologetic for being in HR instead of owning what we do. Every other profession says, I'm a salesperson. I'm a finance person. I'm a marketer. We go, I'm sorry. I'm in HR. Right. Or, oh gosh, I'm in HR and we just, ugh, everything is, you know, dark, doom and gloom and uh, we have to deal with those effing people. And you go, wait a minute, you're, you're a person. And we forgot that. We have lost the idea that HR people are humans as well. We just completely beat it out of them. So the whole book is own what you do, love what you do, and thrive in what you do. All right. I love that. And then you've got a new one that you're working on right now, correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. Called HR Rising. Is that correct? HR Rising. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. So uh, the, the tagline, because every book has to have a tagline, evidently, uh, it says from ownership to leadership. So the whole point is now that you own what you do, how do you lead from where you are? Uh, but it's very similar. It's not a, a model. It's a series of stories and different attributes and behaviors that can help you lead. Uh, regardless of the level you have in HR. So you don't have to be a CHRO to lead. You can be a coordinator to lead. You can be a director, whatever. Role. FD admin three, lead where you right. are. Lead where you are. And, and so I think it's just something that's been missing 
just as I felt the other part was missing in our profession. I'm just trying to fill the gap to have people be more confident in what they do. Awesome. I love that. So if someone has listened to you and, and heard these heartfelt stories and they can clearly hear the passion in your voice, they want to connect with you or they want to learn more about what you're doing, what's the best way to do that? Uh, two places I, uh, are best. One, LinkedIn. But understand, if you connect with me on LinkedIn, I want to see a message from you, why you want to get to know me, and I will connect with you, but it's on. Because now you're a connection. I'm going to know who you are. I'm going to check up on you. I'm going to see how you're doing because I want you to succeed. So don't connect with me just to connect and go, ooh, I have another person on LinkedIn. Understand that we're making a commitment to each other. And the other part is Twitter, uh, where I'm very active and visible. And my handle on Twitter is at S Brown HR, and it's Brown with an E, so S B R O W N E H R. Awesome. Steve, I really appreciate you taking time out of your day to spend some time with us, teaching the, the students here as a faculty, uh, a, an adjunct, if you will, for HR Summer School. This has been so much fun. I am honored to spend some time with you, and I really appreciate you um, sharing your, your expertise with us. Thanks, Ben. It's been a pleasure, and I love seeing you all the time. Awesome. Good deal. Thank you to everybody else. Hang on for more HR Summer School coming right up. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Steve Brown. As I mentioned, this is a replay. HR Summer School is not coming right up. It's actually happened. And you can get the on-demand replay of that entire event, Steve's conversation, plus 50 other speakers at humanresourcesacademy.org. Thanks, everyone, and we'll catch you next time. Thank you so much for joining me on the show today. I'm honored to have you as a listener. If you enjoyed this episode, please take 10 seconds to rate it at iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to your podcast. Also, if you know a friend that could benefit from today's conversation, please pass it their way. After all, a rising tide lifts all ships. To see show notes, sponsor information, and our full show archives, visit OnlyHumanShow.com.